you to BBC One Now, the politics show with Jeremy Vine and Tim Donovan. Hello and welcome for the first time to the politics show. In a week that snow brought Britain's transport system to a halt, there's been more embarrassment for rail chiefs. A man who was delayed on an intercity train for two years arrived at Newcastle Central Station where he called for the resignation of Stephen Byers. This week on The Politics Show, Labour's rank and file riven by war. The Prime Minister may have won friends among the hawks in Washington, but can he still win over the doves in his own party? We found new critics among Tony Blair's closest allies. Also, the lion shall lie down with the lamb. Norman Tebbit finds friends in one of Britain's most multicultural communities as we lift the lid on the politics of asylum. Here at London's City Hall, if the capital is geared up for a biochemical attack, why don't we know more about the plans? That's all to come, and I'll be speaking to the Labour Party chairman, John Reid, plus our new political cartoon. But first, the latest news with Darren Jordan. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Good afternoon. A major investigation is underway to find out why the space shuttle Columbia exploded in the skies above Texas, killing all seven astronauts on board. Debris from the spacecraft and human remains have been found spread across hundreds of miles over two states. Daniel Bircher reports. Across 500 square miles of Texas and neighboring Louisiana, the recovery of the wreckage of Columbia continues. Thousands of scattered pieces, every one a possible clue as to what caused the shuttle to break up. Here, a helmet belonging to one of the astronauts who died, and on a patch from a spacesuit, seven names are clearly visible. I knelt down and looked and noticed it had all the crew members' names. Uh, it had the in insignia of the flight itself. Um, and it, at that point, it, it, I had to fight back the tears. It was, it was sad. Officials have removed human remains from one location. From the moment contact with the shuttle was lost, it was clear there would be no survivors. In Columbia, Houston, we see your tire pressure messages, and we did not copy your last. NASA has released recordings of the last communications, a calm exchange, no signs of any concerns. Roger, uh, but then only silence and static. Columbia is part of several More pictures today of the crew members, among them 41-year-old Laurel Clark, a doctor and naval officer. She'd promised her eight-year-old son she'd return safely. Her brother says she died doing what she loved. She realized pretty early on she was a strong spirit, and it was good that she uh, worked hard to get to what level she was at and was doing what she wanted to, and she was lucky. Three separate investigations have been set up to determine what caused this tragedy. NASA says it will work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to find answers. Booster ignition. One of the areas it will look at closely is the takeoff, when a piece of insulation broke away and hit the left wing, though that is just one line of inquiry. Across America, there is deep shock at the loss of Columbia, and prayers will be held later today for the seven astronauts who died. Daniel Bircher, BBC News. Well, let's go to our correspondent, Fergal Parkinson, who's at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where the shuttle was due to land. Fergal, do we know anything more about how the investigation is progressing? Well, this investigation is still very much in its initial stages and is concentrating on that damaged left wing. Now, we know that the wing was damaged during takeoff when Columbia lifted off from here 16 days ago. Some debris fell off and hit that wing. And it was that wing that started giving them problems during Columbia's re-entry. They lost some heat sensors to it and the crew were working on that problem when Columbia started to overheat, then just seconds later, the, the, the space shuttle completely disintegrated. So that's the main focus of their investigation. And Fergal, briefly, there must be a deep sense of shock where you are. Complete sense of shock, just not in this community, but across the country. Memorial services will take place here throughout the day. Flags like the one behind me are still at half-mast here throughout the country. And now at sites like this NASA site and throughout, uh, flowers are being laid for the crew members that died. 
Fergal, thank you. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, has said he supports the idea of holding asylum seekers in secure accommodation until it's clear that they pose no danger. In an interview in a Sunday newspaper, Dr Williams said such a scheme would be perfectly reasonable so long as applications were processed more quickly than at present. A leading loyalist paramilitary has been shot dead in Belfast. John Gregg, a prominent member of the Ulster Defence Association, and a second man were ambushed in a taxi in the docks area of the city. They thought the killings are related to a loyalist feud. That's it. The next news on BBC One is at ten past five. But now back to you, Jeremy. Darren, thanks. Mr Blair has some serious convincing to do. Much of Europe is not happy with his line on the war, but just as pressing, his own party is deeply anxious. Anti-war sentiment runs deep through the rank and file, and in the Commons, scores of MPs are reluctant to accept what he's doing. The Politics Show has uncovered evidence that once loyal supporters of Tony Blair are willing to oppose him on Iraq. I'll be talking to the Labour Party chairman, John Reid, in a moment. But first, Gillian Hargreaves reports. Across Britain, there's an epic battle going on between the Doves and the Hawks. There's also an epic conflict within the Labour Party. There's a cohort of Labour MPs back in their constituencies this weekend who insist on UN support for any future conflict in Iraq. Hugh Edwards, on his way to Monmouth in Wales, has plenty of war to jaw about. What is your position now on what should happen if there is to be any future um, decision over Iraq? Well, I have a duty to represent the concern of my constituents, and many of them are written to me, fair-minded, decent people who have uh, a deep concern and unease about uh, imminent military action against Iraq. I've always been loyal to the government. Uh, I've sometimes thought that the government was wrong on a few things, but on this, I think we have a duty to represent our constituents. It's not only his constituents. Labour's foot soldiers express their opposition on paper. These are Labour Party members writing to you saying they are furious about this and the more than members they're activists as well they're the people that helped me win this seat for the third time uh, and whose support i would want to try and retain it again next time these are not sentimental peaceniks richard clark is a self-confessed blair supporter what sort of Labour Party member, would you describe yourself as? I joined the party in 1998 from a trade union background, but I would consider myself more of a sort of Blair supporter than uh, previous types of uh, Labour administration. What are your thoughts now on the eve of presumably some sort of conflict in Iraq? Well, not having many disregards with the Blair administration thus far, I'm pretty uh, concerned that we seem to be following the coattails of America into war. This is an old-fashioned public meeting to discuss a high-tech future war. Tony Blair doesn't get the chance to come to many events like this, but his backbench MPs do, and they have to listen to rank-and-file opinion while being loyal to the leadership. Sometimes that's difficult. So, anyone willing to kick us off? Yes. Richard Clark, Monmouth Constituency Labour Party. I firmly believe the only way forward is through the United Nations and a second resolution. If America and Britain were to act unilaterally, doesn't it at best make the United Nations irrelevant and at worst obsolete? Hugh Edwards knows he can't ignore his party members. Labour has a strong anti-war tradition. After all, Tony Blair was once a member of CND. And back in 1992, people left the party because of the leadership's support for the Gulf War. MPs and Labour Party officials don't want the same thing to happen this time round. But the discontent around the country is gathering momentum and the collective clamour is being heard loud and clear back in London. President Bush's reluctance to seek approval from the UN has placed the Labour Party top brass on high alert. There was unprecedented security for the Prime Minister when he arrived at Labour's meeting of its national executives this week. Wherever you turn, there are unhappy Labour Party members. 
And things have taken an absurd turn at the City of London branch, which meets here at the Hands and Shears pub. They were so angry about any future conflict with Iraq, they wanted to resign en masse. The only problem is, that's against the Labour Party's own rules. But that's just a sideshow. It's when people like him start criticising you're in trouble. I've never voted against the government. I've been in the Whip's office. I've had a job of trying to persuade people sometimes when they've got reservations about policies to vote for them for the greater good. Um, we should all stick together as part of the Labour Party in Parliament. But I think it is so fundamental, uh, the possibility that we could go to war without a specific legitimate approval from the United Nations. That, to me, is very basic, because otherwise, who decides what's right and wrong in the world? Do we leave it to the United States to decide because they've got more military power than anybody else? They can use it when and how they choose? I don't think that is right. This is a line in the sand for me, and I will not cross it. Other dovish loyalists fear the bellicose rhetoric could damage the party. Faz Hakim was the Prime Minister's political advisor in Labour's first term. It's one thing to say that this is not a war against Islam, but it's when you see that the people who are making all the decisions are not Muslims, um, and when you see that they're talking about a crusade, or talking about, uh, about it in, in, in the sense of control and taming of the Islamic world as though it's a bad thing, um, that I think resonates with Muslims in Britain and Muslims in the Labour Party. So I think there needs to be con some convincing done um, that this isn't about some sort of control mechanism. Um, but it also needs to be much more inclusive, I think. They're not all doves, though. There are a platoon of about 30 hawkish MPs, one of whom is Labour's only former professional soldier. Clearly, we all would much prefer to have a resolution, and I think we'll get one, but if there weren't, uh, because of some idiosyncratic judgment by one of the permanent members of the Security Council, perhaps, then if the evidence has been presented, it will be convincing, people will be convinced, and action uh, will have to be taken, regardless of whether uh, there is a second resolution. The government is taking nothing for granted. We've been told MPs have been telephoned and asked if they would support a war without that crucial UN resolution. Party unity rests on the answer. In the long term, it would create a, a fissure in the parliamentary party, which would be very difficult to patch up. I think it's such a fundamental issue. So long term, it could be very damaging indeed. It's not going to bring the government down uh, tomorrow or the day after, but it could eat away and corrode uh, at its uh, basis of support in a way I think would be terribly unhelpful. And Stop has been able to do many of the other very good things in our programme that we want to carry out. This is uncharted territory for the Labour Party. A rump of MPs deeply uneasy about going it alone with a Republican American government. It's said the problem with doves is that once you set them free, they don't always come back. The Prime Minister should perhaps take note. Julian Hargreaves reporting. With me now to discuss Iraq is the Labour Party chairman, John Reid. Dr Reid is a former Northern Ireland secretary and armed forces minister who took up his current post last autumn. Welcome and thank you for being our first guest on The Politics Show. Thank you, Jeremy. Let's go back to, to what Mr Betts said in that film, close colleague of yours, that uh, he wants an assurance Britain won't go to war without a second resolution. Can you give him that? Well, I think the first thing to say, following the, your introduction, is I don't see things in terms of hawks or doves. Uh, I mean, that makes graphic television, but the language of the Avery, I don't think, covers uh, the, the problems that we have. What we have is a lot of good, decent, honourable people, as somebody said on there, whether in the Labour Party or in Britain, uh, who I think accept that there is a, a unique threat from Saddam Hussein, uh, who want to see that resolved, who want to see it resolved, if at all, peacefully, and in the last instance, want to make sure that there is the maximum unity in the international community, especially through the United Nations, uh, in order to give the maximum legitimacy if force has to be used. Now, that is something that's united right across the Labour Party. But Mr. Betts just... specifically wants an assurance that Britain won't go to war without a second UN resolution. Can you give him that? Well, the interesting thing about your film is what it didn't mention is that when this issue was discussed in some considerable detail as late as last Tuesday in the National Executive Committee, uh, 22 people against four voted to back the United Nations and the leadership of Tony Blair on this question. But you can't give them that assurance, we, can you? Yes, I c what, I, what I will say to you is what we've said all along. We have strained every muscle to go down the route of the United Nations, to bring in not only the European countries, but the United States itself. 
We want to see a second resolution. Incidentally, it's not a second, it's a 12th resolution. And the only circumstances under which we would consider it legitimate to uh, envisage military conflict without such a second resolution is if the inspectors themselves came back and say there has been a material breach, uh, but for some uh, national interest reason, one country puts a veto on that. So we want Which to is get why, that is it route. why your, your whips have been apparently, we heard there, phoning round and saying, look, if there's, would, you, would you agree to it without a second resolution if, for example, all we lose are China along the way? No, I think what the whips are trying to do, as they always do, is to test the temperature, as we want to do, and the thing that unites everyone is the desire to support a solution with the United Nations. Can I just say this? Everyone refers to that, but very few people actually know what the position of the United Nations is on this. And let me just refer, because I brought it with me, the famous Resolution 1441, which very few people have read, and I hope everyone in the Labour Party and anyone interested in this actually looks at what the United unanimous position of the United Nations is. Look at point one, which is not that there's a presumption of innocence against Saddam Hussein, but that he has continually carried out material breaches of all of the resolutions of the United Nations. You, on that basis, let, me, let me just finish, right. because it's crucial that we all understand what the United Nations unanimous position is. That's the first one, that he's already in breach. Secondly, that he's been given one final chance. This is not somebody who's been up for testing with no previous record. He's been given the chance of an amnesty, and thirdly, that in order to get that, he must unconditionally and immediately cooperate with the inspectors. They're not there as detectives. Right. Do you believe Their this job is to get the weaponry do, do he has you, to hand over. Do you over. believe there's sufficient justification for us to go to war today? Well, we're not being asked to go to war today. Do you today. believe the justification is there at this moment? Well, all I can say is that on my reading of what the United Nations have said, which is unconditional, full, active cooperation, if you read what Hans Blix has already said, Saddam is not cooperating, he's not uh, allowing flights by U-2 over oversight, he's not encouraging uh, the uh, scientists themselves to give full information. He appears to have forgotten to mention something like 3,600 3, tonnes of chemical agents that could be used. He, fears, he, he, he seems to have lost 6,500 chemical bombs. But why he is seems it proving, to, well, let, I mean, let, 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 This is Hans the, Blick. Well, we've seen the list has, has been published. Why, well, do, why is it in the light do your of... Viewers, of do your viewers know what Hans Blick said? That he said that there was a, there's enough, there appears to be enough biological uh, precursors there to constitute five thousand litres of anthrax. Now, this isn't a set of car keys he appears to have lost. This is massive scale of weapons of mass destruction. So by Hans Blix, the inspector's own view on this, I think any objective observer would say it is in breach of what the United Nations All said right. was his Let, final chance. Let's talk about your party. Why is it that so many people in your party, they've seen these facts in the papers, don't seem to be prepared to support the cabinet view on war in Iraq? Well, th but they do support it, and I said we only last Tuesday. In the film. What, what they've been saying on the film is that if we go uh, to the stage where we have to have military action, they want it with the support of the United Nations. That is the cabinet position. That is why Tony Blair has spent his time going around uh, recently getting support from the European nations, trying to make sure that America went down the United Nations route, which it has done trying to make sure there's unity between Europe on the one hand and, uh, and the United States on the other. Everything we have done is in accord with what people wanted us to do. Do you not think that but large they, uh, numbers of your party members, Dr. Reid, are worried with the whole concept of war in Iraq, period, whether or not there's yes, a second resolution? Yes, absolutely. And nobody who's a decent human being should consider the possibility of war without anxiety, without concern, without worry. Uh, so I fully understand that. That's something I share. And oppose it? Well, some, some of them do oppose it, and some of them are under any circumstances. Some of them, even if Hans Blix came back and the United Nations passed the second resolution, which was what the majority want, some would still oppose it. They're the ones who opposed it in Kosovo. And they're the ones who opposed it in Afghanistan. No doubt would have opposed it when we went into Sierra Leone. But you see, when it is done 
with the broad backing of people. And I believe that when the United Nations comes to consider these reports and look at what they've already said, we will have the broad backing of people. There are very few after Kosovo who say, well, actually, people wanted Mr. Milosevic to stay, or after Afghanistan who say, well, it was a terrible tragedy that you went in and got rid of the you, Taliban. You would understand, though, why your party members might be fed up with Labour making alliances with, with Bush with Aznar, with Berlusconi, all these right-wing leaders? Well, there aren't that many left-wing leaders left in Europe at present, I have to say. And one of the reasons that we are the preeminent one uh, in Europe on the left and progressive left politics is because of the hard decisions that we took. And the question you see at the end of the day, Jeremy, isn't uh, whether someone else decides that it is in their national interest, but for us to decide, is Britain under threat? Is Saddam Hussein a unique threat? and to decide in Britain's interest. Now, if we decide it's in our interest, our national interest, it doesn't make it wrong because the United States agrees with us, All right. any well, more than it makes it wrong because President Chirac is taking longer to come to our conclusion than perhaps we did. But I believe, ultimately, he will come to that let's, conclusion Let's look well. at a couple of quotes. In 1994, Tony Blair said, I was 10 years old when Nelson Mandela was imprisoned on Robben Island. Since then, the words Nelson Mandela have been an inspiration. Uh, last week, Mr. Mandela himself said, he, Tony Blair, is the foreign minister of the United States. He's no longer prime minister of Britain. Does it make you uncomfortable when you see that? Nelson Mandela is undoubtedly a great man. I think he's one of the, the greatest men of the last hundred years. I think he has huge qualities. Uh, he is a, a towering figure. Is he infallible? He's not infallible. You see a grain of truth He's, in what he says there? No, I see a concern in Nelson Mandela, uh, which it's arises, valid. well, it's a concern, and it's a concern that has to be addressed. But what Tony Blair has actually been articulating is precisely what the collective wisdom of the world through the United Nations has laid down and Resolution 1441. Now, if I have to choose, even with a towering figure like Nelson Mandela and the rest of the world put together, then you know, I will support the United Nations. And that ultimately, it's, it's not only Saddam who's going to be judged over the, the coming period. Uh, that is certainly true, and he's trying to conceal, he's trying to suppress and harass the inspectors, and I believe he will be judged. Dr. But Reed. it's also the United Nations, Thank and if, if they lose integrity and potency, then there really will be a much more difficult world a Thank few you. years down Dr. Reed, very much indeed. And if you're watching in Wales, you can see more of your views on Iraq later in the programme. And let's sample some of the other stories we'll be looking at around the UK at 12.35, starting with Northern Ireland, where a leading loyalist and a second man were shot dead when their car was ambushed. It has further overshadowed attempts this week to break the deadlock and restore devolved powers to Stormont. Jim Fitzpatrick is in Belfast. Still a long way from a deal then, Jim. Perhaps not that long off, Jeremy. The outline of a deal between the government and Sinn Féin is expected this month. On today's politics show in Northern Ireland, we'll be taking a look at the potential shape of that deal, what moves the IRA is contemplating, and will it be enough to persuade unionists back into government with Sinn Féin? And as speculation mounts that the IRA is preparing to scale back operations, we examine the growing tensions within loyalism following last night's double murder in Belfast. Thank you, Jim. Over in the West Country, it's the cutbacks in rail services that are making political headlines. Amanda Parr is at Bath Spa Railway Station. Amanda. Well, if it's not the weather wreaking havoc with our trains, then it's the policymakers. Plans to upgrade this mainline link between here and London have been shelved. Other local services, like the one that runs between Bristol and Oxford, have also been cut recently. Campaigners warn that more of this could happen. MPs this week all agreed that the West's rail services were badly underfunded. So if that's what they're saying, then what are they going to do? That's what we'll be looking at in the politics show in the West, Jeremy. Thanks, Amanda. Well, let's go to the northeast of England now, where there's a dispute over taking fishing boats out of service after new quotas came. Tony Baker is in North Shields. Tony. Yes, Jeremy. Is support being abandoned by more and more fishermen as skippers and crews turn their backs on the sea. The reason? Tough new limits imposed on catching fish by the European Union to conserve stocks. Now, 60 miles from here in Scotland, uh, the compensation package is being offered of £50 million. In England, it's only £6 million, and there's a big row about that. 
Thanks, Tony. And all the main political stories where you live are coming up at about 25 to 1. Now, the political parties are supposed to have agreed a truce on asylum policy. They weren't going to use language that fueled hatred. But the issue is not going away. The Conservatives say terrorists are coming into the country posing as refugees. Mr Blair thinks we might need to tear up treaty obligations to deport them. And church leaders are worrying about where all of this is leading. So what should the politicians do? Max Cotton went to one of Britain's most multicultural communities and discovered some unexpected views. The United Kingdom under siege. The most explosive link in politics, the terrorist with the asylum seeker. And a subject few at Westminster have got the stomach for, race and immigration. An estate in Wolverhampton, the black country. Politically, this area is still synonymous 35 years later with Enoch Powell and the racial tensions of the late 1960s. The estate here houses hundreds of asylum seekers and asylum is the number one issue. When politicians in London up the ante on asylum, passions rise here. This family is fleeing torture and persecution in Iran. Manage, her children and her husband Hussein are protected by the European Convention on Human Rights. They can't be sent back while there's danger at home. But the Prime Minister has suggested pulling out of part of the treaty, not to spite these people, but because he wants to thwart terrorists. They took me to prison for my idea because I didn't believe what they are doing. And they torched me in the prison. Do you think if you go back to Iran, you'll be tortured again? Uh, I signed that paper. If I do anything anymore, they can kill me. The convention helps the desperate, but it also protects the terrorists who are seeking asylum. It's those the PM wants to deport. But it seems a lot of effort when we're told just 13 people are behind bars, protected by the treaty. One of the paradoxes behind this whole thing is the government is saying, we need to derogate, we need to reserve, we need to remove ourselves in the convention in order to be able to remove these 13 people because they're this terrible threat to the United Kingdom. But they're already in detention. They've already gone to the trouble of opting out of the convention to allow them to be detained indefinitely. So in what way is Britain made more secure by removing people currently in detention to countries where they may or may not be or likely to be tortured or killed? In what way does that make Britain more secure? Even if few on this estate would sympathise with that analysis, right at the centre of British political life, there are plenty who would. I think there'll be no question of us withdrawing from the Convention. I think that would just said to placate extremist opinion. I think placating extremist opinion is always a mistake. The government ought to hit the issue head on and say we have a duty to asylum seekers and say statistically the relationship between asylum seekers and terrorists is negligible. Have no truck with the nonsense, but hit the critics head on rather than compromising with them. One of the characteristics of the debate about asylum is the apparent lack of any real debate. White, middle-class, liberal political leaders are accused here of hiding behind some perceived threat to national security when the blacks, whites, Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs of Wolverhampton just want them to be honest about the real issue. For the people here, this is a straightforward debate about immigration. Most of the asylum seekers are housed around here then? In the tower blocks we've got the young male single uh, asylum seekers uh -huh. and in the masonettes we've got the, uh, the young families with their young children. Right. Malkinder uh, is a councillor on the Heath exactly. Town estate. Uh, he says there's been trouble from some asylum seekers here. He's a Labour councillor who, if he was a white Tory, would be on pretty tender ground. And, well, he does sound a little bit like Norman Tebbit. Okay. 
I think it's about time we did face up to the, the facts and the reality of what the community want and what they need to see. They need action and they need uh, uh, policies in place which are going to work for the local communities rather than uh, outsiders. Was he not Powell right? I don't think he was right uh, up to a point, but there are issues in regard to the whole issue being debated and discussed. Which he, ha which he had right? He, he raised the issues and I think we've swept them under the carpet and it's about time we did bring them back onto the table. What's happened is that, particularly since the murder of PC Oaks, that a debate has started which says it's about terrorism and about asylum seekers but is actually spreading far more widely into the issue of immigration. And for years, immigration has been the elephant in the living room. Nobody wanted to speak about it. Only vulgar people mentioned that it was there. But I think that debate is now on and it's going to spread. <laughs> Toss away your well-prepared racial stereotypes. You won't need them. This is what a well-integrated group in the All Saints ward think about their asylum-seeking neighbours. <laughs> You come out of your house and they're, they're there. Yeah. You, go, you, you get Exposing out of your car, they're there. You go to the local shop, they're there. Everywhere you turn, they're there looking white English girls. Black. Meal mm. ticket. Black. You know, black mm -hmm. girls. They think if they get in with them, they're going to be able to stay in the country. I've been putting money into this country. I'm working six, seven days a week. Yeah. Why should I be put back of the queue and somebody can come in straight away, get benefits, get housing, housing? Free tickets to pantomimes, free tickets to, to football, football matches. Are we really saying that Enoch was right? No. He wasn't right. To, wasn't he right. said it in the wrong time. It should have been now he says it right because at this precise moment, right, there's a lot of people who've got resentment. We ain't we're racist could, because like, we're all together. We live in a multi. You know, if we was racist, we would not be sitting here with these gentlemen today. Do you think white politicians are afraid of being called racist? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That's why they won't speak out and they won't do anything about it. But mainstream Conservatives are starting to talk about it. They want to stop people from voting BNP. They feel that they've been deserted by the establishment. They feel that there's criminality, for example, going on around them that nobody's doing anything about. And so if somebody, however ill-informed, however extremist, however ridiculous and ghastly they may be, comes along and persuades them that they will take action, then they are inclined to go and vote for them. And uh, that's a dreadful state of affairs because it could lead not just to BNP councillors, but to uh, the BNP becoming a serious political party. The Home Secretary has described our society as a coiled spring. Does the tension mean we have to have this debate? And if we do, how do you get the jack back in the box? Max Cotton. We've heard a lot from politicians this week about prospects of war in Iraq, so we thought we'd make room for a more detached view of the causes of war. Jonathan Wolfe, Professor of Philosophy at University College London, took to bed to give the matter two minutes' thought. I doubt very much that philosopher and pacifist Bertrand Russell was Churchill's chosen bedtime reading during his darkest hour. But Churchill was very much in Russell's thoughts. War has always been a battleground for philosophers. Sitting here on Churchill's bed in the cabinet war rooms is a grim reminder that the 20th century was a century of war. But then, so is the 19th century and the 18th. And it looks very much like the 21st will start the same way. You could be forgiven for thinking that war is an inevitable part of human existence. Bertrand Russell refused to take this for granted. Twice imprisoned for anti-war protests, he thought he knew how to achieve world peace. Diagnosing war as a result of gang rivalry, he proposed single world government. If we all belong to the same gang, no rivalry, no war. Such ideas generated the ill-fated League of Nations and, after the Second World War, the United Nations. But in trying to forge world unity, we may have overlooked something. More than a century before Russell, Immanuel Kant, the greatest philosopher since Aristotle, argued that to avoid war, we should create governments which give their citizens freedom, rights, and a political voice. Liberal democracy is the word. We could achieve a pet peace.
Democrats, Michael Doyle, has pointed out a remarkable thing. Liberal democracies do go to war, but not with each other. Never. Doyle lists hundreds of wars, and in not one of them do you find liberal democracies fighting each other. You try to think of one. Jonathan Wolf thinking out loud. Still to come, what will Tony Blair and Jacques Chirac say to each other when they meet next week? And some light relief from our resident cartoonist, Mumph. But first, the latest in politics, where you are. This is where we'll be every week, London's City Hall, home of the Mayor and the London Assembly. And this week, the threat that could bring chaos to the capital. No, not a few more inches of snow, but the prospect of a chemical, biological or some kind of radioactive attack. The government says the danger is real, but have told us little about what to expect. This is its most recent TV public information campaign. Put boxes of earth or sand on the stairs and along the walls of the cupboard like this. It's 30 years since that was made at the height of the uh, Cold War. But if there is a similar threat now, what should we know about it? Should we know more about uh, what to expect if it should happen? We'll be asking the minister to answer that in just a moment. It is a difficult call. How do you inform without causing panic? Well, Carl Mercer has been behind the scenes with London's emergency planners. <laughs> Today's breed of terrorist knows no bounds of geography, of inhumanity, or of scale. The dilemma is reconciling the warning of people with alarming them. So just how much should Londoners know about what's being done to protect them and what they should do if there was an attack? The capital's safety is currently overseen by a committee of emergency services, councils and utilities, known as London Resilience, set up in the wake of September the 11th. If I said to you London Resilience, would you know what that was? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Wouldn't have a clue. clue. <laughs> What's going on in the capital is the difficult task of pulling together and plugging the gaps in several separate emergency plans. At the top of it all, of course, is London Resilience. Then there are the 32 London boroughs, 32 primary care trusts, the NHS, and of course, the emergency services. Potential evacuation from yeah. warning. And the same with schools. All are stepping up their training. We were allowed to film this exercise at Westminster Council, based on mass flooding after a terrorist attack on the Thames barrier. This looks impressive enough, but joined up thinking by the London boroughs has been less so. In one tabletop exercise about a nuclear attack in North London, the borough concerned ran out of stretchers. When it asked the neighbouring council to borrow some, it was told, sorry, we'll have to check with the district auditor. Outer London emergency officers have also complained privately to us that they haven't been kept in the loop of plans to evacuate central London. Which we have complete emergency stock. Everyone also wants more money to pay for equipment like this in Wandsworth. But there's also a call for more openness from boroughs who feel they're well prepared for any attack. In terms of information, I don't think that you can ever give enough information out. So does that mean you'd like to see more people given out? In Wandsworth, certainly, um, if you were to ask the man on the Clapham omnibus whether he had enough information, I would assume that he would say no. In fact, I know he would say no. What Londoners might like to know is that, despite official silence, plans are well advanced for a major attack on the capital. We've learned, for example, that four sites, including one here in Uxbridge, have been identified as mortuaries in the event of mass casualties. Should Londoners know that? Well, George Bush clearly feels so. The man he's appointed to oversee America's fight against the bioterror threat is all for being open. When people understand information, they feel empowered. And uh, that tends to reduce panic when things happen. Jerry Howard took that message to the heart of London Resilience, to Nick Rainsford, the minister who chairs it. It's said to have fallen on deaf ears. I was in a number of meetings there, and um, different people had different views on how much to uh, put out. I've heard some, uh, some other folks that I've met with um, in London and in the UK feel that um, uh, a little more information should get out. Well, inside... Uh this uh, canister, as we call it. 
At the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel, Gareth Davis is all in favour of openness. This orange skip in the car park contains enough supplies to decontaminate hundreds of chemical attack victims and a store downstairs acts as backup. Up here we have what are called chemical agent monitors and these allow us to actually sort of uh, sniff casualties. It may sound scary stuff but he says staff are actually more confident once they've seen what may be involved. When you uh, put them through a training program you show them the equipment that we're going to give them to protect them, show them the, uh, the processes that, by which we would decontaminate the patients and the, uh, the casualties and show them the plans and then they practice the plans. Actually, you can feel quite robust after that. Maybe a lesson for government. Too much knowledge may not necessarily be a bad thing. Well, Nick Rainsford is here, uh, the minister with a key role, um, chairing that uh, key resilience committee. Can you ever have too much information about this threat and how it might manifest itself? I think there's a very fine balance to be struck here because obviously we need to be as prepared as possible to deal with the consequences of an attack. But more important actually is to prevent an attack taking place. That crucially depends on good intelligence. And people will know that over the last few weeks there have been a series of arrests which are the result of very, very good intelligence work. If we were to be too open about what is going on, that would actually play into the hands of terrorists and make it more difficult to prevent attacks. So we have to tread a very fine line here, and I'm conscious that people are frustrated that they don't necessarily know enough. But ultimately, my responsibility is to ensure that London is as defended as well as it possibly can be against you attack. You don't have to be open about what intelligence is telling you about the likelihood of such an attack, but could you not be more open about the possible scenarios, what people should do will have to do if something like this happens. Well, this is another problem, uh, because whereas at the beginning of the Second World War, it was easy to see that the biggest single threat was bombing and to put in place arrangements, sirens and so forth, so people knew what to do. We are now dealing with a very wide range of different circumstances, some of which could involve people being advised to go into their house uh, because of potential chemical threat outside, some of which could involve mass evacuation, some of which could involve a series of different scenarios. Yes. It is very difficult to give people in advance full information about all possible eventualities. But you, what we but are you, you're doing a good do job now. I mean, in 30 seconds, you've, you've told us more than, you know, it took me a couple of hours on a website to find even, even that sort of material. So should you not be being much, much clearer about just those eventualities? What we have been trying to do is to put in place arrangements that will ensure, in the event of any incident, that there is a very effective communication network using all available channels mm. to reach people and give them the messages they will need to well, have. Seeing as you bring that, that up now, I mean, how would you do it? Say it happens, say the worst scenario happens, Leicester Square or Trafalgar Square. Information is one of the key things here that we understand you're a little bit worried about behind the scenes. Well, we will need to use and will use a range of different mechanisms, including the emergency services themselves that have uh, well-prepared means of getting mm. to people, mm. using the media, a range of media, using mobile telephones which provide a very good communication Texting network. Possibly, is that yes, yes, indeed. There are a whole range of different elements all being planned, some of which will fail because right. in certain circumstances certain networks will not be operational. That's why you need backups and you need alternative means of communicating and we are preparing this very carefully indeed. So you do accept that while Tony Blair, other ministers like yourself have been making it quite clear that intelligence is suggesting it's a question of if, uh, rather when, rather than if this is going to happen, that the amount of information that's available as to what you would do about it is lagging somewhat behind. You've got some way to go. As I said, I think there is a fine balance to be struck here. What we are trying to do is to ensure that people know that arrangements are being put in place to try and guard against eventualities uh, without panicking people. Because remember, one of the terrorists' main objectives is to disrupt society. And if they can engender a sense of panic, uh, that will achieve their own ends. And on that is not in our interests. On that note of, uh, of panic, and, and not, in, you know, not entirely similar, but, uh, but let's bring in Gary Fellows here, who was a, a victim of uh, the nail bomb attack in, in Soho um, three years ago. Uh, you were in the Admiral Duncan pub at the time. What do you feel about what you have heard uh, from the Minister in the last uh, couple of minutes? I, I think what Nick said is, is basically quite right. It's, it's a very fine balance between educating people and, and panicking them. And the terrorist objective is to terrorise people. So um, <coughs> I'm, I'm quite encouraged by what I've just heard from Nick.
I mean, after your own experience, obviously yeah. you were injured, but uh, uh, but but you're here now. Um, yeah. Did it change your behaviour? Did it change your attitude to, to such sort of fears or threats? I think the one thing it removes from you is this barrier of it won't happen to me, mm. you know, which most yeah. people have until you've been in something like that and you realise that it may well happen to you. So a lot of people think it's so unthinkable, it's so unfathomable, mm. the concept of a sort of chemical biological attack in London. Well, you're, you're more inclined to be sort of less sceptical. I think people are nervous now, mm. probably more than they've been in a long time, probably since the Second World War. Um, but they still can't really think uh, that it's going to happen to them. And we, we've always had a great faith in the authorities, I think, mm. in this country, um, mm. and, and still do. Like, oh, they're bound to get it right. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, from what I've heard today, it seems that they, they are doing an awful lot we don't know about. Simon uh, Hughes, uh, MP for Southwark and Bermondsey, Liberal um, uh, Democrat Home Affairs spokesman. Do you, you share those sentiments? Or are there any areas where you're, you're worried about what we're not um, getting here? Well, certainly there are difficult issues, and, and I understand government will want to treat, tread carefully. My presumption is that you can give people maximum information. That's where I start from. And I don't think we've gone as far down that road. We haven't got enough. What sort of things then do you think? Well, for example, there are plans for evacuation. There are plans for keeping medical supplies. Now, I don't think it alarms people. I think the British are very calm and measured mm. um, before events. They understand these things happen. They will expect them to happen. I know, for example, it's not a secret that the Met and the police and other people have prepared for all sorts of eventualities. Now, I think it would be perfectly reasonable on a regular basis, not in an alarmist way, annually, twice a year in the stuff that we get through our letterboxes for the information that says these are the sorts of things that may happen. There may be an evacuation plan. The people who will take charge of this are these sorts of people. Uh, hospitals will need supplies. Uh, they will be provided. And the way you will get information is to go to Just as we go along, so what about that mail shot? Um, that sort of information. Londoners have shown that they haven't panicked. Even though we've had rice in Discover, we've got court appearances, we have Tony Blair warning that there's a real threat. We need to give them more. Well, once again, there is this difficulty that if you provide a leaflet saying, in Simon's example, and perfectly fair example, mass evacuation, people then may react to it mm. in an emergency when that is exactly the wrong thing mm. to do mm. because the emergency is not one well, that would, yes, I mean, would actually that merit. Here now. Let's, let me give you um, a few emails, a few um, views from some viewers. Ignorance is not bliss, uh, one of them says. Rebecca Daly, she says, give us the information so we can educate and protect ourselves. Give us some answers. Bob Cowell takes a, a, a more measured view, perhaps. Important for authorities to take appropriate measures to prevent a terrorist atrocity, but it would be stupid to let potential terrorists know the details by publicising what those measures are. And then we've got this from Alex Evans, and he's the editor of Continuity Insurance and Risk magazine. He says that containment and quarantine will be difficult. There'll be key issues. You've touched on those. Coordination is vital, and this is his concern. Without communicating a planned response to people, they will assume it is uncoordinated. If the worst was to occur, people would be easier to manage in great numbers if they knew what to do next. You've touched on that. Mm. But where are we going with this? I mean, I know there's a sort of civil contingencies bill, yeah. planned, imminent. We need to sort of get out into the public domain that evacuation procedures, contamination procedures and so on will be different here. There are new things, new forces in play with chemical and biological weapons. I think the single most important change that's been instituted since the 11th of September has been the creation of this very integrated London resilience team that pulls people together, not just from the emergency services and the local authorities, but from a wide range of other organisations, the utilities, the transport operators, uh, the business community, mm. all of whom will need to be aware of what to do in a range of emergencies mm -hmm. and it's that communications network to ensure that people are informed yeah. in the right terms depending on what happens right. uh, that is very much central to our whole approach. A lot of people think, and Simon Hughes you might share this, it seems maybe it's inevitable with London, 32 boroughs, 30 primary health trusts and, and so on, but it's sort of committee heavy. I mean isn't there any reason why they couldn't be getting together and allowing some much more information out to, to you and I, your constituents? Well. We're in the building that epitomises the fact that, thanks to Nick and his colleagues, we have London government back again. And, and London has wanted that, and they've got it. And this is the place where the family of organisations include the body responsible for civil defence. Quite rightly, that's a London-wide, it would be nonsense for it to be 33 mm. uh, different authorities running it. I believe that there is scope for giving people measured information, not in a way that's misleading. Uh, on a regular, We're about to get our mailing telling us how much council tax we're going to pay for next year practical suggestion to Nick and colleagues that could include mm. a leaflet which deals with the basics 
and also gives people the place to go to for more information that is the best authoritative information at the time. I think people would welcome that. And I don't think, and I share Nick's view, we don't want to undermine the intelligence. There is very good intelligence work. I think we have very good intelligence services in London, but they are getting on with other things and the public should help provide information to deal with that too. OK, for the moment, thanks very much indeed. Of course, you hardly need a terror threat to bring the tube to a standstill. Nowadays, other forces, natural and man-made, do that anyway. The week began with a collision and ended with a cold. Sunday and the investigation start into last weekend's derailment that's closed the central line. Monday morning and the scale of disruption becomes abundantly clear. Then on Tuesday comes this message from the mayor. Every day there is not a fatality on the underground is a day we have been lucky and it is a matter of luck which is why I want to, to get control of the underground as rapidly as possible. The more closely you look, the more questions that are asked. Are all eyes on this block of wood. At least it can't get any worse. Can it? Then, after several inches of snow, stations are closed, points are frozen, and the network comes to a shivering standstill. Uh, Nick Rainsford, your take on the week on the tube? Well, not our finest hour, I have to say. There have been... Uh, very serious problems for people who have suffered very considerably, not just here in London but elsewhere, as a result of the, the weather and, uh, frankly, a failure to respond as well as we should have. Uh, and I think there are lessons there. I think uh, uh, Alistair Darling was quite open in saying there is much to be done to improve uh, response in these circumstances and he is determined to do that and I wholly share that view. I mean, well, what a week for it to happen. Uh, a day, we understand, early next week, finally some of the differences, disputes between Ken Livingstone and the government should be resolved you may well have been coming some way to like meeting his concern about the 1.3 billion shortfall or whatever he says is needed under your privatisation plans. Is that true? What's the latest? Uh, well, I think he has taken the wrong line on this. I think he has uh, held back the investment which is needed and uh, delayed it. Uh, and by scaremongering... But he'll be, he'll be the person who'll be taking frankly, over, though, imminently. He's, he's the right man for the job, though, isn't he? Uh, well, I'm, I'm afraid to say the scaremongering that you've just heard uh, is not actually helpful to running a... Uh, transport network which is vital to the lives of millions of Londoners and which actually has a very good safety record. Yes, there's a need for improvement, but it doesn't help to convey those kind of uh, unjustified scaremongering messages. Gary, I mean, I mean there's another reason for you being here today. <laughs> you uh, also survived the, the, the Hatfield rail disaster. You know, I'm keeping my, t my distance, but <laughs> I mean, do you have a view you, about... No. A lot of people obviously are making those, those links between yeah. what's happened in rail privatisation and what may happen in the tube. Um, do you make those, 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 those links? Um, I, was, I was a great fan of privatisation, I have to say, in the 80s. But although it's been you know, spectacularly successful for some industries, it certainly hasn't for the rail industry. And um, I'm very nervous of PPP for the underground. Mm. I mean, I think most, most tube users just want investment from wh wherever source it comes from. Uh, you know, we want a world-class subway system. And Simon Hughes on the, on the sidelines here. Um, what's your feeling about who's to blame more for where we're at and at this stage between you know, Ken Livingstone and the government? Well, I share Gary's view about what we need. I think we need investment. It ought to be as sooner rather than later that we have the London Underground handed over to the London Democratic Government. Uh, my party has argued, and I supported them, that you could have gone out into the market for bonds to get the investment. Um, if the deal is done, then it's no good going back over history. But the real danger of private sector partnership is that people put profit before safety. Absolutely. And Nick Rainsford, I mean, you've heard here from, from, from Gary Fellows, I'm absolutely no confidence in you know, PPP or privatisation ending the sort of problems we've seen this week. No, the key thing is it's not privatisation because London Underground will continue to be responsible to the mayor, to the public sector, and it will be run as a public sector operation. The maintenance, the upkeep, the introduction of new rolling stock, that will be handled by the private sector, which does it at the moment. They do it in different types of contracts, and the whole purpose of the new contractual arrangement is to cut out some of the waste, the inefficiency, and the cost overruns that have been endemic in investment in public transport in the past. OK, to all of you, thanks very much indeed. Well, MPs get enough stick from some people, don't they? What do they do all day is one uh, well-heard refrain. Well, many have a remarkably good grasp of what's going on in their constituencies, on their own patch. How clued up is yours? Over the next few weeks, we'll be putting a few to the test. Number one on our list, Labour MP for Ealing, Stephen Pound. Where would you find what was called 
the London Central and District School and who was the most famous inmate? Well, the Central London District School was built in 1844 and closed in 1933. It's now on the site of the present Hanwell Community Centre in the middle of the Cooper Estate and Charlie Chaplin would probably be the most famous resident. What time does the number 83 bus stop running from Hanwell to West Day Lane? Number 83 runs um, fairly late, runs about half past 12 at night. What's the name of the first school in Ealing and Britain for autism? Um, the Sybil Elder School, which is in Florence Road. In what year was the Hoover Building built? Well, I wasn't there at the time, but I think it was 1933. Within a six mile radius of the clock tower behind me, there are three professional football clubs. Can you name them, Steve? Well, Brentford, clearly, Queen's Park Rangers, and I sincerely hope Fulham FC. A mere four out of five for Stephen Pound there. He needs to spend a bit more time with his bus timetable, the number 83 is a 24-hour service shame. But could your MP do better? We want to hear your suggestions for future contestants. Let us know on our website. Next week is uh, Eric Pittles, Pickles, the Conservatives' London spokesman. We'll be trying to get the uh, MP to Greenwich to agree to do it very soon as well. Could be tricky. That's it from City Hall. Back to Jeremy. Bye-bye. Hello again. For months, European leaders papered over the cracks, but all it took was a letter to bring the feud over Iraq out into the open. Britain and seven others signed a declaration of support for American policy. France and Germany weren't even asked. So is it a permanent rift? And just how icy will the atmosphere be when UK and French leaders meet next week? Our Europe correspondent, Paula Guanadonna, is here. Icy, glacial, frosty, what's the word? Well, we might well see a couple of inches of snow on the presidential carpet when they meet. Ironically, this was supposed to be a very chatty, fairly relaxed fireside uh, meeting to mend relationships after a little spat that Mr. Chirac and Mr. Blair had in November. It looks little now. Um, now, the spat um, has turned into a split, and uh, what Mr. Blair needs to obtain in the short period is to have France on board um, on a possible second vote, a second resolution in the UN to decide whether to go to war against Iraq or not. France is part of the uh, permanent uh, Security Council and therefore has a veto. France has to be on board or be persuaded at least not to vote, to abstain. Germany almost certainly would vote no, but Germany doesn't have a veto, so it's, it's sort of less important in the immediate future. And uh, the, the, the understanding in political circles is that France might be persuaded to come around, but possibly not next week and not for a few days anyway so there'll be some suspense for Mr Blair. And do you see a longer term knock-on power for these relationships? But in many ways that is a, even a more interesting question what is the long the, the long term effect the knock-off effect of all this once the dust has settled or the sand has settled after a, a possible Iraq um, uh, conflict uh, what will happen to Mr Blair's twin ambitions of leading in Europe and being the vital link with the US Many say that today those two ambitions are, are you know, in tatters. Paula Buonadonna, thank you very much indeed. And finally, we've got our resident cartoonist, Mumph, with his own take on this week in politics. We'll force Saddam to hand over his oil, I mean chemical weapons. I have to make America less dependent on foreign sources of energy. So, Tony, I give you Iraqsville, the 51st state of the Union. Uh. Just imagine, Tony, burgers in Baghdad, baseball in Basra, and a freeway to free-flowing oil. But, you know, you simply can't do this. Why not? Because I thought we were the 51st state. Personally, I think the best way to defuse the situation is to send the leader into exile. I've already chuffing well tried that, but that chuffing Gilchrist refuses to go. But you've certainly turned up the heat on the firefighters. Looks like the gloves are really off now. No, they're chuffing not. Chuffing it. There's never a great gun to sit down when he won't want. Bump. And that is it for our first programme. Thank you very much indeed for watching. We'll be back same time next week. But if you want to get in touch with your comments or your stories, we'd be delighted to hear from you. You can email us via our website. 
I'll be on Radio 2 as usual, midday tomorrow. Hope you can join me then. But for now, for me and all the team on The Politics Show, goodbye. As he's just said, Jeremy Vine is on Radio 2 talking to people in the news and getting your comments. Weekday lunchtimes, 12 till 2 on...